Welcome back to Fireside, a podcast from FS Investments. I'm Laura Raim, Chief U.S. Economist, and today we're going to talk about a $1.6 trillion market, one that is rapidly evolving and is critical to our economy and to investors. It's private debt. I'm pleased to be joined by Robert Hoffman, a managing director and head of Credit Wealth Solutions. Rob, it's a rare treat to have you in the office these days. You've been out on the road a ton talking to investors and advisors. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's always great to be here. Also in the studio is Andrew Kors, the dangerous executive director. I say that because your knowledge base just keeps expanding, Andrew. Uh, You're an executive director on the research team, and you've recently co-authored an incredible paper on this topic. Um, I'm going to give several commercials for it throughout uh, this podcast today, but I hope uh, if you are interested in private debt, you will give it a read. Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Laura. And they they keep me cooped up in the office much more so than Rob, so (laughs) (laughs) they don't let me out much. Rob is is our face. I was there once. I was there once. (laughs) They set me free. (laughs) All right. Andrew, I'm going to pitch the first question to you because— I, you know, know that there has been a lot of buzz around this air, this space and this asset class, but take us through sort of the 101 initial, what is private debt? Yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's, it's smart to start there because it has, it has changed and shifted over time as the asset class has grown. Um, so private debt, just to kind of set the baseline, private debt is, is just the debt of a private company or a borrower that's extended by or held by a non-bank lender. Uh, you know, very simply, that's kind of the broadest definition. People frequently kind of use private debt and private credit interchangeably. Private credit is, um, again, the most commonly cited part of private debt, but it's it's more specifically sort of directly originated loans to corporate borrowers specifically. So I think it's it's helpful to kind of frame out the pr- the private debt market uh, more broadly. I th- I think of it as sort of two primary verticals. The first being private corporate credit, private credit um, that includes things like direct lending, which is mostly you know senior secured loans to again private corporate borrowers, mostly top of the capital structure. There's mezzanine debt, which is subordinated debt, uh, preferred equity, and there's venture debt, which is basically direct lending to um, early stage venture companies. And then there's the asset-based finance or asset-based credit side of the house, um, which includes things like real assets debt, um, you know, uh, commercial real estate debt, which is a six trillion dollar market, infrastructure debt, and you have sort of your pure asset-based finance, which is sort of a hodgepodge of um, different, you know, uh, sort of credit strategies within consumer, which, uh, within hard asset, within asset-based lending, things like lending against um, accounts receivable. Uh, inventory, right? Uh, and then, you know, contractual cash flows, things like IP, music royalties, et cetera. So, you know, you can think about this as the corporate credit side, extending credit to a corporate entity um, with a broad claim on that firm's cash flows, and the asset based side, which is lending against or purchasing, um, you know, diversified pools of financial or, or, or hard assets. Okay. And then there's sort of the specialized strategies like like distressed and special situations, which, which kind of sit on their own. Gotcha. Um, but I think, you know, uh, Rob, I think, you know, is in the weeds on this stuff. I, I'd be curious, kind of, can you kind of walk us through what, what some of these loans look like? What are some of the terms? Um, what types of borrowers are we talking about here? Because yeah, that was a lot, you know. I think, yeah. and, that, and I think yeah. we're going to dig into a lot of that. But like, tell us what's typical. What's the typical yeah. deal look like? Yeah. You know, so, the hard part about answering that question is that technically, private credit and private debt span so many asset classes yeah. and so many different types of lending that it's hard to pin one thing. I think one of the things that Andrew said, like the difference between private debt and public debt. It's, it's not so much that the company itself is a public or private company, but I think it's traditional public finance is companies would go to a bank and a bank would help arrange a financing, be it bonds, be it loans, you know, whatever the form that it took. But because that activity was done through the bank, that made it a public debt offering. Right. Whereas private has really stepped in and to a certain extent replaced the bank where you're dealing with a direct lender or a group of direct lenders acting together, filling the role that the bank sort of used to play. So, you know, private credit, uh, direct lending is certainly one of the areas that is most common and one of the largest sectors within private debt. And there, you know, so what does a typical private loan look like? It looks a lot 
like the public floating rate loan market has historically looked like. It's just that instead of having a syndicate of 100 different borrowers, you maybe have one or three or 10. Uh, and so to that extent, it's a senior secured floating rate loan. You're secured by all the assets of the company, typically five to seven year maturity dates. They are very common uh, floating rates. So they're based on SOFR uh, and it's SOFR plus a spread. Uh, typically, you know, it, it obviously depends uh, on the time frame and the range, but two to 400 basis points over public markets. So if today, you know, spreads in public markets are 300 to 400, private credit spreads may be, you know, 450 to 650. So really attractive overall yield. Yeah, I mean, I think the long term average is two to 250 basis points of yield premium over the public comparable. Uh, and then that sets aside all of the unique bespoke opportunities within private credit when you get into MEZ and special situations and really complex deals where you can get, you know, pay in kind or pick coupons and really high yield and debt with equity kickers and all sorts of other stuff. But the regular way loan is typically a senior secured floating rate loan, five to seven year maturity, you know, so for a plus. 450 to 650, you know, that type of borrowing. So, okay. All right. So I think, you know, something that we really need to dig into is why this market has grown so much right now, because I want to talk about the structure in a little bit and really sort of why as an investor, this is so attractive and clearly the yield is going to be a big yeah. piece of that. Um, but, you know, Andrew, take me through some of the backdrop. What has caused this market to just really go from being something that, you know, felt very niche and only, you know, the most wealthy sort of or pension funds were interested in to something that now we're really seeing interest in from such a wide variety of investors. Yeah. And I think the, the, the reasons for this growth have. And borrowers. It's yeah, not just, inve you know, absolutely. that's so important to understand. Yeah. And I think, you know, as sort of a disclaimer, we're, talking about the, you know, a lot of these topics will apply to the private debt market broadly, but we're kind of specifically talking about regular way, direct lending, private credit here. Um, you know, I think the market, that market has grown pretty tremendously over the past, call it five to 10 years. Yeah. You know, assets under management globally, $500 billion in 2015, to your point, $1.6 trillion today. Now, that sounds like a big number. The private sector debt market globally is, you know, at the floor, at least fifty trillion dollars. So, wow. still kind of a drop in the bucket in terms of the overall global private sector debt market, but you know, growing pretty quickly. And I think there's sort of two sides of this story. Uh, on one side is sort of the factors that have impacted the ability for traditional lenders to lend, and the clearest example of that is the banks. Um, the risk taking capacity for the banks has kind of been slowly eroded away over the decades. Um, banks have consolidated. You know, Dodd Frank was probably the, the the biggest sort of earthquake here in 2010. Where this has been like this secular retracement has. of the banking footprint. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and you know, today the average bank holds only 50 percent of its assets in in actual loans wow. versus two thirds around 1990. So yeah, the industry has changed. Um, you know, Basel Endgame is is still kind of hovering out there. So we could see some more of this. We'll see. And obviously, as you've talked about a lot, Lara, the the impacts of an uh, of an inverted yield curve on on the banking industry. Um, you know, the volatility we've seen in public markets, Rob brought up sort of the traditional syndicated loan and, and high yield bond markets. Um, you know, these markets kind of got really volatile during 2022 and part of 2023. Um, and I think what you saw was private lenders step in to where public markets were maybe not willing or able to provide credit to a lot of these companies, private lenders could take sort of this longer term view on the credit worthiness of that company and we're able to kind of uh, put capital to work. So I think those are and, and that'll sort of ebb and flow over time. But I think those are kind of the broad, um, you know, lending factors that have contributed to the growth here. And then there's the the capital demand factors, right? The borrowers. Um, and I think the growth of private markets here is a really important point. Companies just want to stay private longer, to your point, right? They don't want to have to deal with going public and dealing with a bunch of shareholders and getting credit ratings and um, all of these disclosure issues that are onerous in terms of time Especially and cost. Especially if you're a smaller company. Exactly. I mean, if, yeah. if you're Apple or Google, it's no problem. But if you're a middle market company, right. 
that's a, a big ask. It you want to work with somebody more personally. Absolutely. And, and you know, every, every company has, has their own unique reasons. But, the, you know, this is this is a trend we've been seeing for decades. And I, I, and I think it's only accelerating from here. Um, the other thing is, like, these borrowers are um, they're growing. Right. There's a survey out there of middle market companies. Two thirds of these companies expect to take on new debt to grow in the next year. That's the highest we've seen in, in, in 15 years. And then the final thing would just be the refinancing need. We've talked a lot on this podcast about the commercial real estate refinancing wave that's coming. It's true a bit to a lesser extent in corporate debt, but it's still there. Um, there's going to be a lot of capital that's going to be needed for refinancing this debt going forward. And that's just another source of demand here. Rob, why is that attractive to investors? I mean, I, again, we just talked about the yield. Yeah. What are investors getting out of this and how do they fit into this new growth of this market? Yeah, I think it, it's interesting. If you go back to, say, the, the syndicated loan market and the very first loan funds, which were called the prime rate funds, and they came out in the 90s. And at that time, they were actually structured as interval funds, you know, quarterly liquidity funds. And there was some broad adoption. But what ended up happening in the debt markets, like a lot of things, is that there was, as the growth in, in mutual funds and ETFs and indexing, there was a broad adoption of moving all of those to daily liquid structures. And for a long time, I think when we think about the typical retail investor was really this demand for something that's daily liquid. But what we have started to see over the course of the past 15 to 20 years is broader and broader acceptance by investors of being willing to own an asset that's not necessarily daily liquid. And I think you've seen that interest from investors move down from you know the big institutional investors into the ultra high net worth investors that are com that are used to doing things like drawdown funds and now it's moved in into what we sort of term the mass affluent as you have seen broader and broader adoption of more limited liquidity type investment vehicles and then over the past five years that's only exploded even more as it's become yeah. broader and you've seen more and more platforms uh, that have adopted these types of strategies. And so what that's enabled, I think, is when you look at a lot of private debt, the nature of a, of a loan or a debt, whatever it is, only being owned by a small handful of lenders, inherently that asset is not particularly liquid. Yeah, And it's not really appropriate to hold in a mutual fund, for instance, that requires daily liquidity. And so I think as investors have started to understand the yield premium that's available in private debt markets, some of the investment benefits it can bring to a portfolio through diversification and low correlation, the multitude of private strategies that are out there combined with a broader acceptance that I don't need to have 100% of my portfolio liquid 100% yes. of the time. It's, it's grown this pool, and then, frankly, as returns have been pretty good, yeah. it's this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that people started to do it. They liked the returns. It grew a little bit. Some new platforms started to offer these types of, of products. More people bought them. Returns generally stayed pretty good, and it's grown and grown and grown, and, and it's, you know, it, it's moved from almost an institutional market it, it's still an institutional market, but Very you've added so. you've added the retail component, which at you know when you look at you know assets held in IRAs and other places, it's it's hundreds of billions to you know yeah. trillions of dollars that are there that that has allowed this market to grow so significantly over time. It's something I've heard you educate people on for years now that you need to have a match of the structure yeah. with the investment, and there's a reason why. Um, you know, we there there is this limited liquidity and this structure because these aren't deals you can just trade in and out yeah. of by any stretch of the imagination. That's what makes them more profitable and more um, attractive and to everybody yeah. who's involved in them. So, yeah. I mean, we've always seen. You know, everyone likes to talk about the the Yale endowment, David Swenson, and you know they moved move out of traditional assets and 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent allocations to alternatives. And I think you now, it's just more and more common to see financial advisors talking to end investors saying, look, can we get 5, 10, 20, 30 percent allocations to alternatives and the benefits that that can bring to portfolios? And private debt has been a big beneficiary of that trend. 
But I think underlying all of it is it's there because the returns have worked. And, yeah. and a lot of these strategies have worked really well for investors. And that has created to continue uh, uh, continued demand. For sure. I mean, and Andrew, in the paper, um, you give an example of a portfolio with 15 percent allocation. Mm-hmm. So I just think it's really helpful to have these real world examples, you know, especially with everything that's going on today in the 6040. You know. I think that's a good, that that's a really good point. We, we talked about you know the liquidity, um, you know the illiquidity of the asset class and sort of the yield premium, and I think those those two things are very much connected, right? So you know you think about why borrowers want this, right? It's it's the execution yeah. certainty, it's the ability to get deals done. You know, a, a syndicated loan process can take, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, but two to three months, and you're sort of as a borrower uncertain whether that's going to price or where it's going to price over time. Uh, private lenders can do it quickly and they can give you certainty because they do have that sort of longer term view, right? Um, you know, there's flexibility on deal structure and on deal terms that private yeah. lenders can offer that, you know, a bank, for example, in a syndication is is sort of targeting it at the, at the median investor who's going to come in and, and, and buy that loan. Um, and then of just knowing your lender, right? Relationships are important. Um, you know, if there's an issue with, with the borrower, the ability to, to negotiate, um, to you know, do repeat business. All of these things, I think, are benefits to borrowers, and are uniquely um, suited for private debt because it is a liquid, because it's sort of lend and hold. And you know, you think about borrowers being willing to to sort of pay up that extra two, two and a half percent in interest cost. It's because they can get these benefits that are unique to private credit because it is an illiquid asset class. So I think. That illiquidity premium we talk about in private markets is available because it is illiquid and sort of that allows it to 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 um, offer these unique benefits. To yeah, buyers. and I mean, I mean, I think that's you know we talked about the fact that the yield that you're often getting is more than you could get through public markets. Yeah. Why would a borrower want to? I mean, that means a borrower is paying more yeah. for yeah. this. Why yeah. why would they want to? Yeah, well, I think it's one of the biggest changes that we've seen in private credit markets over the past 10 to 15 years to now, which is before it was all about size of company and the amount of money that you were borrowing. And we'd use a figure like $50 million of EBITDA or, or as a rough proxy for cash flow. And if your company generated more than $50 million of EBITDA, you were typically borrowing enough that you could go to a bank and gain access to the syndicated or public debt markets, which was generally cheaper. But if you were smaller than 50, you know, as a function of Dodd-Frank and post-financial crisis, now the banks weren't there to do those types of deals. Your deal wasn't going to be liquid enough for the market that demanded liquidity. And those borrowers had to go to private lenders. But what has really changed, I think, as we've seen this growing adoption of private credit is that that range has expanded so that you could now target companies with 50 to $150 million of EBITDA and still have a very large pool of companies that are also seeking private debt solutions for a lot of the things that Andrew mentioned, from speed of execution, the ability to do some bespoke structuring terms, uh, and in many cases, just the, the preference of dealing with a small group of borrowers or a single borrower instead of a bank cohort of a hundred different lenders that they arrange because you know typically as a borrower if something goes wrong if you need to get an amendment to your debt agreement you may have to go out and get a 51 percent vote of your lenders which if you have 100 or 150 different lenders that may not be easy or even three publicly traded banks they're going to have different priorities or you know god forbid you start to run into problems and have to deal with restructuring type issues and then you get a bunch of really aggressive lenders that step in and they buy half your deal and their goal is to put you into bankruptcy and take your company versus if you can build a relationship with a single private lender or just a few private lenders you have an idea maybe a, a better idea for how they're going to act and what they're going to do and that's why i think you've seen a lot of private equity firms that even have the option to do public debt saying well you know in this instance i'd rather do private debt or some private equity investors that have basically said we don't really want to do the public markets at all anymore private debt is so big and, and we're able to do multi hundred million dollars of deals through through private credit we'd rather just deal with private lenders we understand it may cost a little bit more but that's a we think that's a better place to be as a private equity firm that owns these companies versus going to the public yeah markets. and and just 
just to kind of put a final point on that, Rob, yeah. like even if, I mean, we've seen a lot of volatility in, in, again, public markets over the past couple of years. And there's been times where they've been open. There's been times that they've been closed. And you, know, you think about if you're a borrower, like building a relationship with these private credit firms is really important, right? Because right now you may be able to go out and get a syndicated loan to finance your your leverage buyout or, or whatever it is. But the next deal you do, you know, the the public markets may not be quite as open and you want to have those relationships ready so that you can go to them and say, hey, I have this deal I want to get done. Syndicated loan market's tough right now. Can I come to, you know, can I come to you, uh, you know, for this capital? And and so I, I think more and more this these, these partnerships between private equity and private credit firms are becoming really important. Well, but I think, and I, I just want to also raise something that you've told me many times, which is that it's not an either or for our financial markets. Yeah. Private markets are not going to erase or take the place of public markets. Like we need banks. both yeah. or banks. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think to me, what I see is a is a much more diversified capital landscape, which is only a positive for markets and for borrowers yeah. and for our economy. And, frankly, and we've seen that. I'm an economist. That's why I always <laughs> take it. But and, you know. no, it's a good thing. I mean, we saw that in 22 and 23. I mean, you know, the again, the public markets were challenging. Private credit came in and did a lot of deals. Q1 of this year, you know, public markets got a little more benign and there was a little bit more competition. So I think it kind of smooths out the the ups and downs of the credit cycle, which, sure. which you know, hopefully can help smooth out the ups and downs of the economic cycle, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and look, something that you mentioned, Laura, the, typically, especially the larger companies get, they are often if they are private, they are often owned by private equity firms. Private equity firms aren't dummies. You know, they they know what they can do. They know what the options are available to them. And you're seeing this growing and growing preference in many cases to be able to access private credit. You know, they know should they go public, should they go private, where is the best opportunity for them to raise money? Sure. And it's not that private credit is there as a lender of last resort only to the worst companies that don't have any options. Many cases now, it's very successful, very well run, great growing companies where the owners of those firms have said, look, we think this private credit solution is better for us at this point in time versus the options of going to a bank and getting a syndicated or public deal in, in the markets. So not to paint too rosy a picture, I think, you know, you're on the road again, lucky to have you here. I think you're going straight from here to the airport. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when you're talking with investors I know that one of the big questions you get is what could go wrong? Is yeah. this a bubble? That's a broader question. Yeah. Is this a bubble is almost a more like philosophical question. But, you know, a lot of money's come into this space. And I think, yeah. you know, um, you know, recognizing that any investment carries risks, like talk us through that piece of the conversation and how you think about it. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day for a credit investor, whether you're public or private, it all comes down to credit risk your ability to properly underwrite a deal, to properly structure the terms that protect you in that investment, and your long-term ability to analyze that company and its growth trajectory and cash flow abilities. And that, that risk profile of private credit is no different than the risk profile in public credit. One of the differences is that you don't have the same degree of liquidity. So if you're in a public deal and the company reports really bad numbers and the loan trades down, you probably still have the option of selling out of it. You may not like the price that you're getting, but you could still sell it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in private credit, if that if you go down that path, you know, your most likely buyer is someone that already owns it. But in a private deal where there's a lot less owners, there's a lot less potential buyers. Uh, and so certainly one of the risks, and I, and I think investing with a partner who's active in private credit, you want to know that they have a big, robust team. Are they skilled in dealing with restructurings and workouts and complex legal issues and negotiating legal credit agreements and all these types of things, because that very much can come into play as a as a private credit investor and manager. Whereas in the public markets, you say, well, I can just sell it and get out of it and not have to worry about that stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, I, you know, I don't I don't think we see it as being a bubble. As I said, it's not just a lender of last resort. It's not like private credit is just flocking to 
the worst part of the market that's willing to accept private credit. There's a lot of great deals out there because a lot of firms want private credit solutions. Well, that, yeah, I mean, I think bubble implies irrational pricing, right? Yeah. And I know, you know, Andrew, you're I write, planning on writing about this very soon. What, you know, yeah, what, I mean, I think what it's, are you seeing? It's a legitimate question anytime you get a bunch of money that's coming into a space. I think it's logical for folks to ask that, especially when you're dealing with credit markets. I, right? I, I once heard a manager yeah. say that they're actually frustrated that private credit feels like a hot market because it's been around for a very long time now. Well, our, and they want it to be long and perfectly. boring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As we know, yeah. you know, we want it to be sort of set it and forget it. You know, it's a, it's a good investment yeah. that yeah. reaps a lot of, you know, harvests yeah. a lot of return over and time. I think, I, I think to Rob's point, I mean, if private credit, private credit were just sort of doing deals for companies that nobody else wanted to lend to, I think that would show up in more leverage in the system, right? Companies are getting leverage that wouldn't otherwise yeah. th that they wouldn't otherwise have gotten. And I think if you look at this current expansion, this is the perfect case study here, right? So, you know, you've got this period where private credit again over the past four or five years is growing at a twenty two percent annualized clip. Just a tremendous growth in the asset class. But if you look at this economic expansion, it's not driven by increases in debt, yeah. right? Um, especially on the corporate side, um, it's driven by strong income, higher asset prices, and um, growth, and good growth. growth. And yeah, re yeah, really good productivity growth. So, um, you know, you have this period where private credit is really growing. And then you look at the actual broader corporate credit pie, it's it's not growing at all. It's actually lower today as a percent of nominal GDP than it was in 2019. So I think this idea that the growth in private credit is driving leverage levels up, and that's going to be some issue, you know, some systemic issue when we have a downturn, like, it just doesn't show up in the data right now. And I think, again, this is the perfect case study for it. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So, you know, what I've heard is not only reasons for an increase in supply, reasons for an increase in demand. And, you know, this is a market that is it's heterogeneous. It's got a lot. It's backed by a lot of different types of assets. Um, and I think, you know, what your paper does, Awakening the Rise of Private Credit, really gives a long view of these changes and the evolution and the of the depth and complexity the, that this and market the maturation, is going through. I think of the, uh, of, Ex yeah. Yes, that's a great way to phrase it. Yeah. Um, and as it's become mature, um, I think going forward, we've talked a lot about the problems right now facing investors who are, you know, really riding off of a, a the momentum of a good economy, but are facing, you know, an equity market. You know, today is April 17th. The market's up five and a half percent year to date, but, you know, price to earnings ratios are 20 percent. The Bloomberg Ag is actually down three and a half percent year to date because we've seen, you know, fixed income just, you know, interest rates continuing to rise. Um, and then the correlation of the 6040 has just hit a 25 year high. So, you know, when I talk about the positive outlook for the economy, investors are facing a lot of challenges. Yeah. Rob, I'll pitch it to you for the last question. Why now for private debt? Why should investors consider this today? Yeah, I mean, I think you you mentioned the Bloomberg Ag. I think as I was looking yesterday, I don't know how it updated today, but the five year annualized return was exactly zero. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a great point. You know, the the five year annualized returns for private credit are eight to ten percent plus. I mean, it's done really well. And as we think about, well, isn't this a really risky asset class? It's like, well, your risk of traditional fixed income was pretty bad over the past five years, yeah. too. But no one's saying, you know, that needs more regulation. I mean, it's, um, you know, so I think overall private credit, uh, it, it's been a great solution for investors. It tends to generate pretty high income, 8 10 percent plus at times. Uh, the returns have been fairly steady. The uh, you know one of the the large indexes of for regular way direct lending has only had one year of a negative return and that was 08 and it was down five six percent it was not that bad bounced back pretty quickly uh, certainly you get the diversification of dealing with private marks on assets uh, I do think it's important for investors to look at valuations and how those valuations are being done. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the market has generally worked and it's provided good returns and it's added good diversification and it generates high income, which is always in demand. And I think you put that collectively together and that's why it, it has grown as a important part of, of individuals' portfolios and a nice part of 
portfolio diversification alongside 60-40 allocations, and, it, and it's, it's just worked. Yeah. And that's not to say it won't experience periods of volatility. That doesn't mean it's not working. It's, every market goes up and down, and private credit will go up and down like everything else. But I think over the long term, if it can generate these nice attributes and generate a return premium, it'll continue to, to do what it's supposed yeah. to do. I feel like we've just scratched the surface today. I, I, I feel like we should call this a part one and do a deeper dive in a couple of weeks. What do you, what do you think? I say let's do it. Yeah. Back? Yeah. All right. Thank you Sounds so good. much for today. Thanks, Larry. Thanks. Take care. This episode was recorded at the FS Investments headquarters in Philadelphia's historic Navy Yard. It was produced by the investment research team. It was edited and engineered by Aaron Sherman. Video produced by Melissa Vendetti and copy provided by Harrison Beck. Special thanks to show coordinators Ellie Zhang and Laura Coleman. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.